First of all, I would like to thank the Lebanese American University for sponsoring my trip. Uh, I would also like to thank Dr. Annie Bakalian, Associate Director of the Graduate School and University Center of the City University of New York, and Dr. Lena Baidun for organizing this activity. I missed something. Page one. Anyway, okay. Okay. Uh, this is a spatial geographical study uh, of Beirut that presents Beirut not as fixed, but rather as as fixed entity, but rather as performative and multifarious. The capital of Lebanon, Beirut is the capital of Lebanon, but also the capital of many Arabs. It exists as a multiple construct, serving different purposes of representation connected to identity. In other words, it's seen by different people in Lebanon. It's traversed on foot and experienced orally visually, olfactorily, and corporally. It's also, I'm going to deal with it as a gendered and sexualized city, also as atavistic in its layered, palimpsestic means layered histories, as well as modern in the bombardment of the market and brand name commodities. So the book, this is a sort of a general overview. Uh, the book guides one through Beirut as it is mapped in modern Arabic literature. Now, why Beirut? Okay. Unlike New York and London, Beirut is a very small city at the forefront of modernity, of cultural activity, of revolutionary politics, of wars, insurrections, and resistance. A great deal has been written on it. There are a large number of poems, novels, autobiographies, and films, as well as academic studies. These studies on Beirut focus on the city as static and as a static and passive background to the action. Such as, for example, in Miriam Cook's Beirut's Other Voices, and I'm focusing here on literary, uh, literature, and Evelina adds sexuality and war. My study, addresses the gaps in these studies as it focuses on the geographical and the spacious. My point is that the city, Beirut, is not a backdrop for the action. It is an active constituent of the action. Okay, um, here we are. What and where is Beirut? The poet Adonis describes Beirut as not like Damascus, the city of endings, but the city of beginnings. It is not the city of certainty, but of exploration. Beirut is an open project, he says, that's uh, Adonis, uh, that is never completed. What then is Beirut? Is it a village? Sorry? Is it a village, a town? A city? Is it ancient, contemporary, traditional, modern? Is it feminine, masculine, androgynous? Is it secular, religious, sectarian? Is it flesh, stone, cadaver? Is it visual, oral, olfactory? Is it empirical, abstract, allegorical, spectral? Is it urban, rural? liberal, Arab, Lebanese, Eastern, Western, labyrinthine, transparent. Also, where is Beirut located? In private or public spaces? In the street? In the mind? Above ground? Underground? Is it real or imagined? These are, in fact, some of the questions that the book explores. Questions, of course, with no final answers. 
In fact, Beirut destabilizes any teleological imperative. Mahmoud Darwish, the Palestinian poet, writes, Beirut is a city with a thousand faces. Now, theories of geography and space. Now, in dealing with writing for Beirut, I made use of some of these, the books that are, that are listed here, or the, the sources. Uh, Foucault's seminal article of other spaces, where he writes, we are in the epoch of simultaneity, the epoch of the near and far, of the side by side, our experience is less that of a long life developing through time than a network that connects points and intersects with its own scheme. In other words, um, uh, uh, Foucault uh, uh, focuses on uh, the horizontal rather than the, the vertical um, um, uh, aspect of Beirut. Or for, uh, so there's more concern, I guess, with contiguity rather than continuity, okay? Things, uh, uh, Be Beirut as representing things or, or buildings or whatever side by side, you see, simultaneously being there together. The second uh, source is Henri Lefebvre's The, Pro the Production of Space um, on conceptual versus lived space. Conceptual space is uh, the space from above, where, where we, you look at the city as a panoramic entity, okay, coherent, rational, detached. Uh, lift space is hot, passionate, unpredictable, varied, teeming with intimacy. In other words, according to Lefebvre, uh, space is never innocent, and it is, all, it is socially, according to him, produced. The third uh, uh, source is Michel de Sorteau's The Practice of Everyday Life on strategies and tactics of navigating the city. The practice of walking, in fact, in the city, what he calls a pedestrian rhetoric. Um, now, uh, it, he tells us that there's first the concept city, the panoramic conceptual city, uh, found by uh, 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 founded, sorry, by utopian and urbanistic discourse, but according to him, every step taken by, this, by, this, uh, by the city walkers is a potential subversion of these constructions. In other words, each one who walks the city sees it in, in, in a different uh, way. Edward Sawyer, modern uh, uh, postmodern geographies on spatiality with special focus on the interplay of history and geography, the vertical, again, and the horizontal. I also make use of feminist uh, 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 geographers. F uh, space for them uh, is a central category in creating locations for women, as well as a site for women's intervention and agency. Amongst these geog uh, feminist geographers are Gillian Rose's book, Feminism and Geography, Alison Blunt's Writing Women and Space, Elizabeth Gross's uh, Vo Volatile Bodies, and Doreen Mass's Space, Place, and Gender. So feminist theory kind of focuses on multiple locations, or what Donna Haraway refers to as situated knowledges, knowledge in a situation which is normally positioned, contextual, partial, particular, rather than universal. So these texts and others, I guess, set the theoretical framework of the project. Factual Beirut. The novels produce a strong reality effect. Real places, we, we, we see real places in actually all the novels. The Virgin Megastore in downtown Beirut, the Azariyi area, the City Palace Cinema in Rabia Jaber's Beirut, Medina Taht al Ard, uh, the assassination of the writer and journalist Samir Asir in uh, 
Jabers Takrir Milis, the Milis uh, report. Lies Khouri's The White Masks, where the author figures as character. <coughs> Oral Beirut, because we talked about them earlier on, just one. If Beirut is a spectacle where the visual dominates, the war city is also a cacophonous soundscape that can overshadow the visual landscape. In wartime, the acoustics of the city change so radically that sound itself marks the spaces. The landscape itself is mapped by sound. Example, the protagonist, the main character, in Rashid al-Daif's Al-Mustabid, The Obstinate Man, navigates the city by paying close attention to the sounds of explosions in order to locate the safest place to hide in his apartment. In Rabia Jaber's Beritus, the protagonist's neighbor prays to God to save them from the mortar bombs, the 106 guns, and other rocket launchers. In order to protect herself, it's a woman, she has learned to determine their trajectories and locate the sources of their launching. In such an atmosphere, there is no choice but to be orally adept. In a war atmosphere, again, Ghada Saman in Beirut Nightmares, Kawabis Beirut, maintains that the individual in Beirut is transformed into a single huge ear. Olfactory Beirut. The war city is dominated by the olfactory sense, where the smell of garbage, which continues until today, unfortunately, and gunpowder fill the space. Garbage is a prime feature of Beirut. The smell of garbage and gunpowder fill the spaces. At Daif's, Rashid al Daif's, Taqaniyat al Bu'as, Tactics of Wretchedness, is rife with garbage piles that the protagonist smells and observes with outlandish, oh, it's not here, oh, okay, sorry. Garbage, okay, is a prime feature. Um, the smell of garbage is everywhere. At Daif Stakaniyat al Bu'as is rife with garbage piles that the protagonist smells and observes with outlandish fascination. Mahmoud Darwish's autobiography, Memory for Forgetfulness, describes war Beirut as a place assaulted by sounds and smells. I have never before gotten used to vegetable smells, vendors, coals, loud television sets, and the smells of garlic and broiled meat. Discursive Beirut. Beirut also is shaped and reshaped through an amalgamation of discourses, such as newspapers, autobiographies, poetry, fiction, film, theater, media, that bring it to life. The Egyptian protagonist in Beirut, Beirut by Sanallah Ibrahim uh, learns about the city from newspapers and a documentary of the two-year war, the 1975-1976 war. So, uh, uh, so, and he assumes this is Beirut, actually. Now, one aspect, of course, my, of my book, in fact, one chapter, uh, is titled The Rural-Urban Divide. The study also challenges the dualistic approach to the country and the city, and any view of them in binary opposition. In Bal-Is al-Humani's Hayy al uh, migrant it's a, it's a place in Hayy in Beirut, migrants from the villages in South Lebanon live as a cohesive group the way they had lived in their respective villages in order to evade any threat to identity to identity uh, that uh, that uh, the city may posed uh, may pose uh, um, okay so uh, in fact as you know the majority of people who live in beirut actually have migrated from rural areas as well as the peripheries of beirut so we have so many uh, people in beirut who are not the majority i guess who are not really beiruti uh, by birth yet uh, okay um, yet the same rural elements 
deemed fixed and unchangeable, are transformed in contact with the city and prove to be as fluid and unstable as the city itself. The city is marked by a life dictated by rural elements, leaving their marks on the rural residents, uh, uh, urbanizing them without totally er erasing the rural element. Tawfiq Yusuf Awad, you know, death in Beirut, Tawahin Beirut, presents a village, the village as static, depraved, primitive, etc. But the city, a supposed refuge for villagers who run away from their villages, turns out to be a place of endangerment, corruption, violence, intolerance, having a very strong affinity with rural ferocity and revengefulness. The traditional semi-rural consciousness is unavoidable in Beirut, especially after the 1975 civil war. In Lina Kraidiyi's Khan Zada, the three Beiruti female characters, feeling disillusioned with the war and its accompanying ideologies, uh, seek refuge in their sectarian communities in reaction to a civil war that had produced antagonistic confessional communities with sharply drawn boundaries. The rhetoric of walking. In fact, walking is the prime way, actually, of experiencing the city according to the Soto. Uh, he refers to, to it, actually, as pedestrian rhetoric, and the title kind of refers to this indirectly, uh, uh, the rhetoric of walking. Uh, the city speaks through pedestrians who experience a delimited space in the city, subverting again the panora panoramic controlling view that attempts to know the city in its wholeness. Beirut in the Arabic novel is not a totalizing entity. This is an experiential understanding on Be of Beirut based on contingency as opposed to the controlling a noble strategy of the panoptic view. It is uh, experienced as opaque rather than knowable, okay, uh, or rather than transparent. Um, uh, in a war setup, for example, the characters' itineraries in the city, in, in one, one of, or a few of the novels, are restricted to brief encounters. Many of these walkers in the city only walk briefly in the city, okay, uh, because of this geography of conflict and uh, uh, of con uh, conflict and discourse where they accommodate themselves to the ephemerality of the walking nomadic condition. So uh, these pedestrians within the city create new geographies of resistance where different brands of transgressive social um, and, and sexual relations are fashioned. The performances of walkers, male and female, across the city are divergent and contradictory rather than static and uniform. The street is a site of dread, disgust, violence, but also it's a, uh, it's a site of desire, freedom, liberty, uh, and so on. We, we're still there with the rhetoric of walking. Uh, in these texts on Beirut, there are no privileged walkers. Okay, they're just simple, ordinary human beings. Uh, reminiscent, for example, of the 19th century European flaneur who navigated the city for pleasure. Rather, they're ordinary citizens traversing the streets for mundane purposes, developing a problematic relation with the hostile environment of the city they traverse the streets with utmost vigilance by leaving their homes exclusively to attend to personal urgent necessities. Um, <clears throat> uh, Beirut, in fact, uh, or the liter literature in Beirut, has produced a modern version of the flaneur who inhabits these texts and metamorphosizes into many forms. Instead of the flaneur, for example, we have the writer the journalist, the detective, the prostitute, the consumer, the bystander, the stroller, 
the voyeur, okay? All these, uh, the, uh, of course, the, the prostitute is a female version of the flaneur. The flaneur, as a, margin, as a, as a figure, collects clues to the metropolis. Uh, uh, what he does, he walks around and starts looking at clues that represent the metro metropolis. Like the detective seeking uh, to bring insignif insignificant details into a meaningful configuration or constellation, okay? So just as the flaneur tries to understand the city, for example, the, uh, the, um, um, uh, the, um, sorry, the detective, okay, the, de uh, the, uh, the de detective collects also uh, bits and pieces from here and there to get to somewhere, to the truth or whatever. Eroticizing the city. Sexuality, otherwise perceived as private and personal, spill, spills into the public sphere. The city is feminized and eroticized by men who indulge in fetishistic scopophilia, a meaning a sort of voyeurism where woman is seen as uh, an object of display. So men kind of look at women. Uh, as objects. In a city overwhelmed by, uh, by the number of women who fill the streets, uh, it's, a, it's like a shocking surprise for men, traditional men, who come from the villages. So, uh, 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 in Hassan Dawood's, it's not the Matil building actually, it's the, uh, uh, in, in English it has a very funny uh, title, the year of the revolutionary new bread making machine. This is the title. In Arabic, it, it, it's Sanat al uh, So in, anyway, this, uh, this uh, novel by Hassan Dawood deals with these rural men from South Lebanon. And these men go up to the roof, actually, three of them, uh, and uh, uh, where, where they position themselves um, keeping in mind, of course, the proximity between buildings uh, in Beirut, you know, sometimes you, you stand on the balcony and you see the neighbor, you know, in the uh, facing balcony. So keeping in mind that, so these men go up to the roof, okay, and watch women taking off their clothes within their apartments. Um, so that's what we call, uh, uh, wh what I referred to as voyeurism earlier. But the public sphere, controlled by patriarchy, is also central to feminine resistance, which challenges the enforced binary separation of spheres, women inside, men outside. Gender is constructed and reconstructed in the daily, uh, 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 the daily quotidian, uh, uh, in, in the daily activities of the walkers in the street. Now, um, so women's movements around the streets give them access to shortcuts and other hidden locales that provide them with autonomy, freedom, and also anonymity. I mean, it's much easier to kind of circulate in the city without being known rather than uh, in a village. Um, in The Locust and the Bird, actually a very interesting novel by Hanan al-Sheikh, it's a, uh, an autobiography of her mother's life. Uh, a lot of it, you know, is, 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 re is true. Um, the, the cafe in Raushi that accommodates uh, Hanan's mother, her name was Kamila. So the ra cafe in Raushi that accommodates um, women like Kamila are feminized and sexualized, providing a different social ordering where, in other words, it's a different social ordering where men and women uh, can sit together and talk, okay? Whereas in the streets, you know, uh, the uh, people uh, sort of uh, are suspicious of women, of course, who sit and talk with men. But because Beirut is, is a city, they can do that, and the, the, the um, cafe provides a, a, a different social ordering in other words, uh, where men and women are 
talk on, or uh, communicate on equal basis. So in the cafe, Camilla can disrupt the social order by embracing a different order where she can sit and communicate with her lover. Even, and the, the story, of course, or the novel, takes place in the 1940s, you know, and you actually see so many women going out and going to the cinema as well, um, uh, uh, and so on. So, uh, Um, so uh, the city um, uh, gives women a kind of freedom and liberation, okay? Also, we're, we're still there. Uh, in the same novel that I like, actually, uh, Sheikh's novel, uh, the voyeuristic spectacle afforded by the cinema, okay, empowers Camilla and makes her the subject rather than the object of the gaze. Because in the cinema, she's there watching, looking at men, uh, uh, Abdel Wahab, of course, this is one of the, an Egyptian singer and so on. So she looks at the man rather than the man uh, looking back at her. Uh, also, uh, this is a particular mode of urbanization, uh, revealing uh, uh, especially that it takes place in the 1940s, revealing that modernity in Beirut is not new, but it is old and incomplete. And I'll be talking a little bit more about modernity. Uh, now, the male protagonist in Huda Barakat's The Stone of Laughter comes face to face with his own homosexual inclinations and admits that he is attracted to men rather than women. In Post-war Beirut, the carnivalesque masculine performances of some women, such as Abir in Alexandra Shreitech's Always Coca-Cola, Damon Coca-Cola, who insists on taking a woman who insists on taking boxing lessons, mocks the patriarchal order, destabilizing the fixed gender identity. But at the same time, uh, 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 a modernized Beirut in this same novel is mainly represented by Hamra and Verdun areas, uh, and it is juxtaposed with the more traditional uh, uh, area, Marilies, okay, uh, where her parents live. So in order to, to do what she wants, okay, uh, uh, she spends a great deal of her time in the Hamra and Verdun area, showing that uh, not all the areas, not all Beirut is liberal. Uh, in fact, a large portion of it is still very um, traditional. Now, heterotopias. Uh, Foucault defines heterotopia as a space that is other, another real space, as perfect, as meticulous, as well as arranged, as ours is messy, ill-constructed, and jumbled. Rather than viewing locales in opposition, such as rural versus urban, central versus marginal, uh, ordered uh, carnival versus carnivalesque, heterotopia are countersites. And he says, he describes it as a kind of effectively enacted utopia in which the real sites that can be found within culture are simultaneously represent, represented, con, uh, represented, contested, and inverted. Uh, in other words, there are alternative modes of ordering in the city with their own codes, symbols, and relationships of power, and, and uh, 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 which uh, Foucault refers to as heterotopia. Okay? For instance, I'll give you just a, an example. In Jaber, Rabia Jaber's Beritus, the underground cinema in downtown Beirut uh, that, fe uh, uh, that features pornographic films is a heterotopia of desire, a counter space where the young narrator finds refuge away from the war arena of violence and hatred. You know, the binary, for example, uh, 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 East versus West Beirut, okay, uh, uh, 
the, the, the city above is, is a violent city. Uh, the, the cinema is a space of desire, a counter space where uh, uh, the young man can watch um, pornographic film, films. Uh, the whole day, actually. It's true, it's the whole day. Uh, because you know what they do, they, uh, according to the, to the story, they, they, they watch a film and sometimes they can't see the, the, he the head of a, the man or his arm or whatever it is. They're really very uh, uh, old films or something like that. And they, uh, sometimes they come in rather late, so they watch half of it and then they uh, stay on and watch the, the next one and so on. And, and you know, the, uh, I think one of those cinemas, I don't know if any of you who's Lebanese remembers uh, uh, Cinema Cristal, they used to call it, and they used to have pornographic films. But then uh, it became um, the abode of uh, militiamen, you know, who spent a great deal of time. Uh, uh, and according to Rabbi Ajaber, also old men. Um, okay, Mod uh, yeah, we've just started with Beirut and modernity. Now, the hegemony of the modern in Beirut is never complete since the city uh, continues to usurp non-modern components generating its own hybrid modernity. If the city is invigorated with feminine signifiers, such as freedom for women and sexual license, it is paradoxically also a site of intolerance and phallic violence. Beirut fluctuates between tradition and modernity. Starbucks Cafe is contrasted with the exclusively male traditional maqahi uh, coffee houses, some of which consisted of the pavement, the sidewalk itself, where men sit, smoke water pipes, drink tea and coffee, and discuss politics. Um, if women kindle male desire and scopophilia and are subjected to commodification, the resistance to male control is reflected in their own participation in the voyeuristic spectacle where they subject men and other women to the female gaze, as seen in Always Coca-Cola. You find the protagonist of, uh, the female protagonist in Always Coca-Cola always um, uh, um, looking at this model who is very pretty, you know, uh, and perhaps desiring her in the same way that men look and, uh, uh, at, um, um, at women and whatever. Um, so <laughs> it's not only men so, who actually look at women, but also women look at men and other women as well, okay? Uh, uh, at the same time, this model, Yana, uh, fashions herself after the city of spectacle, advertising, and commodification. And so she is the object of the gaze it's, she's an, the object of the male as well as female gaze. Okay. Um, okay. Um, modernity has traditionally been uh, defined in the West image, while the role of other th cities like the third world is consigned to a role of catching up with the more civilized um, West and uh, uh, trying to imitate what they do. Now, modernity in Beirut is not new, as we said. It's old. Let me see if it's here. Uh, yeah. Sorry. So modernity in Beirut is not new, but old and incomplete, imagined and practiced differently in different times and places. It's associated with the emergence of new spaces, particularly for women, 
as seen in Hanan al-Sheikh's The Locust and the Bird, where her mother moves around in the downtown area, uh, uh, regardless of what her husband says. Uh, and again, it's set in the 1940s. In Always Coca-Cola, again, the female protagonist seeks refuge at Starbucks Cafe, which is a stronghold of the modern. It's associated with the, with the US, right? Where she feels free to flirt and philander away from the city. Of course, our Starbucks cafe in, <laughs> cafes in Beirut are a little bit different from the American ones because you can sit uh, at a table. You can, uh, the one on Hamra, uh, I think this is, this is the place uh, uh, Alexandra is talking about. Uh, it's, uh, you have uh, a cafe, a sort of a cafe, and then there's, there are stairs, and you go downstairs, and you know you find young lovers sitting there, and whatever. Okay, so it's uh, it's uh, so so she seeks refuge at uh, Starbucks, where she feels free to flirt and philander away from the city. In contrast, the traditional makahi continue to be occupied exclusively by male customers. Um, okay. The body as metaphor of the city and vice versa. In many of these texts, the city is made and made over into the sim simulacrum of the body, while the body is citified and urbanized. Objects in space and the human body intersect to produce a, syn a synergetic bond, uh, an isomorphic relation between city and body. In other words, the city is made of brick and stone, and the body is made of flesh, and they, they, they sort of uh, acquire similar forms and shapes, you know? Um, uh, I'll give you an example now, um, or two. Uh, Huda Barakat affirms in an interview that we, that is the inhabitants of the city, are the city, and we are whatever takes place on it. Our lives are one. The street is like one of our limbs. The houses are our nightmares, and the rooms and shelters are akin to our anxious souls. In Mu'nis al-Razaz, Ahya fil Bahr al-Mayyit, Palestinian, uh, Jordanian writer, the narrator describes Beirut as panting and speaks of the collapse of nerves and buildings. Similarly, in The Little Mountain, a building sags like an old woman, her joints broken by the shells. In the same novel, the protagonist asserts, what a city, a whore of a city. Who can imagine a whore laying a million men and still there? Uh, when the war is over, okay, we discovered, uh, yes, Huri says, we discovered, or the narrator, that we hadn't destroyed it. We hadn't destroyed Beirut. New wars are probably needed. This desire to destroy the city springs not only from male misogyny, but also from, frust uh, from frustration at its feminine fluidity, inscrutability, and resistance to closure. Because uh, many writers refer to the city uh, of Beirut as she. And uh, you find in the poetry a great deal about uh, whorish Beirut and, and so on. Um, OK. In Hanan al-Sheikh's Beirut Blues, the character Asmahan describes the cars in Beirut, again, another example, with their guts visibly hanging out. In Rashid al-Daif's A Passage to Dusk, Fusha Mustahdafa, Bain al-Nu'as wa naum the injured narrator's body bleeds on the barren asphalt. Quote, I was bleeding profusely over the asphalt, how I wanted my blood to water the soil of distant meadows away from the asphalt that is never thirsty and never quenched. The asphalt invades the narrator's own subjective world, turning him into a facsimile of the fragmented city. Abstract meanings are translated into material signs where the body serves as metaphor of the city and vice versa. The city as a female body and the city as a male phallic image, image are recurrent tropes 
and this slippage recurs throughout the study, revealing the city's puzzling impermeability. One time it's a male uh, figure, another time it's a female, and there's this slippage between the two, so that you don't really, is it male and female then in the end? Uh, it's both, I guess. Public and private spaces. Many novels have the effect of publicizing the home and domesticating the streets. The home in these works is not immune from history, from the outside world, from the war outside. The streets, windows, and balconies in the built environment challenge the separation of public and private spheres. The public moves into the apartment buildings and people inside their apartments can be seen from outside. The staircases assume new meanings and the doors of apartments become more permeable, allowing the public space to trespass into the private. Uh, into, the, uh, into the private spaces and vice versa. And in a minute, I'll give an ex example. An explosion, there it is, uh, causes the character Khalil in Barakat's The Stone of Laughter to envisage his room going out of its place as if it wanted to catch up with the street or with the flats that had been hit. Another example, uh, Nidal's apartment, in Raushi, in Jabur al Dwayhe's Sharid al Manazil, uh, the, the vagrant, I guess, is invaded, the balcony is invaded by militiamen who set up barricades on the balcony. And their living room is now outside the house, like a public street. It's a passage uh, 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 to the, uh, for the militia of the, one of the militias, the popular Nasserite organization to the balcony that overlooked the San George Hotel and the Phoenicia hotels, where uh, there was a great deal of fighting. So they, the balcony becomes, goes out, you know, becomes part of what's going on outside. Uh, in Always Coca-Cola, uh, the billboard, uh, just out outside Habir's room, there's a billboard of uh, Yana, the, the model, uh, drinking Coca-Cola. So uh, Abir's room is reflected in her mirror, uh, the, the billboard, you know, uh, she's looking at herself in the mirror and she sees the model uh, uh, in the mirror. Okay, uh, uh, she's dominated and it, 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 uh, uh, and it shows that her internal world now is dominated by visual culture. Strongly aligned with voyeurism, this is an an urban experience where the outside public forces of the market invade the private spaces of the bedroom. Traffic between the factual and the imagined. The book focuses on the city as physical space, as opposed or in addition to the city as a mental construction. Again, the slippery boundaries between the two, between the city as real and the city as constructed. While Beirut is a city of bricks and mortars, it's also an imagined construct. Each character creates his or her own imaginings of the city, leaving his or her imprint on the city, just as the city in turn marks the individuals who live in it. Beirut, in fact, has attracted, especially during the war and uh, until the 1990s, um, had, had, had attracted intellectuals, writers, artists, revolutionary, revolutionaries, political activists seeking asylum, for example, from, from dictatorial uh, Arab regimes. For many Arabs, then, Beirut is a mythic locale of phantasmagoria, revolution, sexuality, empowerment and culture shifting between a physical space and a set of ideas taken from prevailing discourses on Beirut. Ghada uh, Samman's Beirut 75 okay, deals with two Syrian characters, Yasmin and Farah, who view Beirut as the city of their desires. They associate it with a luring, seductive female. <clears throat> uh, 
and it's a city of their desires, it's a city of their aspirations, and also dream of success and wealth. The city, therefore, is simulated, distorted, prevaricated, revolutionized, sexualized, and gendered. In other words, characters indulge in narcissistic inner worlds to shield themselves from the city's assault. Material description of the urban setting in such novels are absent. So th those uh, novels that deal with internalized problems, you know, they kind of internalize the city because they don't want to confront it. So, <clears throat> material descriptions are absent to give room for interior psychic space that takes center stage. The fear of external spaces produces these internalized solipsistic works which are obsessed with interi interiority, like Rabia Jaber's Beritas and Rashid Daif's The Obstinate Man. Excavating the city. <clears throat> yeah. If walking the city is an encounter with modernity, it's also a confrontation with the past. As an ancient city, Beirut is a palimpsest, a text that is built upon strata, each layer teeming with history. Okay, it's layered and it has a very long history. The novels show that Beirut is a necrophilic architectural dig that awaits excavation, where the mythological past infiltrates the quotidian presence, present. In Beirut, the geographical intersects with the historical, and the past spills, always spills into the present. Huda Barakat, in her very interesting book, The Tiller of Waters, presents a world faced with annihilation and a city burdened with history. The ruins that fill the city are concrete manifestations of a convoluted relation with the past and with the meaning of life and death. In Rabia Jaber's Taqrir Minis, uh, I don't have it here, the, the protagonist's sister, who was kidnapped and murdered in the museum area, cannot be laid to rest. She flashes up, disrupting notions of linear time to tell her violent story of death. Her sudden appearance in the present resuscitates a past whose unresolved mysteries produce threshold figures that hover between the world of the living and the world of the dead. If agoraphobia leads to fear of the external space, especially in a war context, amnesia is the outcome of anxieties generated by the war on characters who lived it and even on those who were too young to remember or were not even born. These characters, predominantly young, as in René Hayek's Beirut, Beirut 2002, insist on living an untainted, infinite presence in the quotidian, uh, present in the quotidian moment. Uh, with, they, they refuse to follow any news about the city, about Lebanon in general. They live in a sort of a limbo, okay? Most of them take drugs and so on, but the war which they did not experience because they were really very young or were not even born, uh, they did not experience it personally, continues to be felt in the present. The specters of war uh, uh, and natural disasters that have plagued the city haunt its spaces, meddling with taken for granted realities. For, ex uh, for example, Jaber's Takrir Milis, where the ghost of his sister appears, so that we have the ghost, uh, who's, okay, a ghost and uh, her brother who's still alive, um, and so on. Uh, the specters of war and natural disasters, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, Rabia Jaber uh, uses the fanta fantastic elements, like uh, falling underground and coming face to face with ghostly figures and so on, to defy the structures and thematic logic of the realistic novel in order to con convey 
an inexplicable experience. So in order to convey this inexplicable experience, he resorts to the fantastic. Um, post memory. Drawing on Marianne Hirsch's concept of post memory, a kind of memory that persists and continues to be felt socially, even though it's not personally experienced, Craig Larkin explores the memory of a generation of Lebanese who have grown up dominated by traumatic narratives, uh, narrative accounts of the Lebanese war, although they have not experienced the war themselves, and refers to it as an inherited form of memory which carries on and connects with the pain of others. In Hala Kautharani's al usbu al-Akhir, the closing week, the young female narrator who finds herself in the Burj al-Mur area is perturbed to find that this same area where she stands now was once thrown with corpses. In the novel, Burj al-Mur is a memory scape, a locale invested with memories of violence. Ghosts of the past haunt the new post-war generation, breeding anxiety. Modernist ruins. Beirut is, is also haunted by the ruins of the recent past. The recent remnants and cadavers of ruined houses, buildings, and other collapsing structures. Unlike the ruins of the classical period, which expressed the invincibility of time and the resisting grandeur of human constructions, which we find in museums, and etc. These crumbling buildings, edifices, referred to by Beatrice Jaguar, uh, Jaguar right, whatever, as modernist ruins, which express the decrepitude and defeat of the new and its ephemerality, ephemerality and the way it rapidly falls into decay and disarray. Example of the modernist ruins. In Hanan al-Sheikh's um, uh, Beirut, Beirut, the famous Dolce Vita nightclub, symbolizing life in the 60s and early 70s, is a ruin surrounded by other decrepit buildings. Now it's gone completely, I guess. In the same novel, the protagonist informs us that she and her lover had swum in the foul-smelling waters of the once fashionable St. George Hotel, where the blackened ruins of the hotels came into sight each time we wiped the salt water out of our eyes. In a Saman's Beirut nightmares, the glittering boutiques of Hamra are in a state of disarray. Similarly, in Hassan Dawood's The House of Mathilde, the building stands as a reminder of urban decadence and architectural perishability, revealing the ephemerality of the new. Very short conclusion. The texts speak Beirut in a variety of ways, producing a multiplicity of worlds and a city without closure. This is a city bespeaking incompletion, ineffability, denying a stable center, resisting ontology, and avowing its alterity and dissonance. Thank you. <laughs>